A Real Life Villain Who Framed Roger Rabbit is a movie from 1988 directed by Robert Zemisky, where a group of cartoon characters are at task with saving their city from being demolished. The villain, Doom, turns out to be the CEO of a car company whose evil plan is to create a monopoly so that he can build a freeway right through their town, demolishing all their homes in the process. This was a scary possibility as a kid, but at least I knew it couldn't happen. Unless you happen to be an African American in the early 1900s, that is. In Cincinnati, 25,000 homes were bulldozed in majority black neighborhoods. That is as if every person that went to EFSC on every campus became homeless, twice. The impact on those communities was devastating. But this targeted injustice wasn't an accident. City planners suggested routing freeways through these blighted areas because it would be cheap to buy and no one would miss them, unlike already prosperous areas for which they warned the dangers of building the freeways too close could ruin their economies, as shown from this image of the drastic drop in property value when placed near freeways. So in the end, these destructive projects purposefully went through areas local leaders wanted redeveloped. This single highway, called the Downtown Kansas City Freeway Loop, required bulldozing over a hundred blocks of housing, worth $650 million today. On top of this destruction, the highways act as physical and monetary moats, cutting off the remaining blighted areas from the rest of the affluent city. Of course, this was terrible, and people looking back on these actions wanted someone to blame, and before long they had uncovered the corrupt secrets to General Motors' rise which led to this degrading car dependency we live in today. How Streetcars Grew Before the car could grow to what it is today, it first had to take out the competition. The first streetcar was invented by Thomas Davenport in 1834. They were like buses that ran on rails and used electricity instead of an engine. They also ran on smooth rails instead of rough cobblestone like the horse-drawn carriages of their time. They were also the most efficient, both in terms of energy used and weight in vehicles. This made them ideal tra form of transport for many decades to come eventually covering over 17,000 miles of tracks all across America. With this meteoric rise and the continued expansion of cities at the time, there seemed to be nothing that could get in their way. How Streetcars Failed Firestone Tire, Standard Oil of California, Phillips Petroleum, GM, and Mack Trucks. They all got together in the 1936, the National City Lines Organization, otherwise called NCL for short was created by them to control the companies in charge of streetcars to make them act in the interest of the companies that supplied them. They just so happened to be the same companies that started the program. In other words, General Motors created a company to control their competition. A similar organization was called American City Lines, ACL for short. This was created in 1943 to, spoke, to focus on the country's metropolitan areas and they soon combined with the NCL in 1946. By the next year, the NCL alone controlled 50 cities in nearly a third of the states in America. Just two years later, NCL and ACL worked together to take over the Key System, a streetcar company in Oakland, California, but were blocked by that company's shareholders. But they only held out for two years before handing ownership over to the growing organizations. Emboldened by their victory, they swallowed up the Los Angeles Railways next in just three years. Their greed did not go unnoticed, and soon a lawsuit against them was made for conspiracy to monopolize their industries. On April 9, 1947, nine corporations and seven individuals were called to court to testify on conspiring to form a transportation monopoly. San Francisco Mayor Joseph Alioto, an antitrust attorney, testified that General Motors exhibits a kind of monopoly evil and that they have purposefully made deals with tire and oil suppliers to run electric streetcars out of business to make room for gas buses which they would all profit from. Another mayor, this time from Los Angeles, testified that GM had used its subsidiaries, ACL, to buy up and destroy the streetcars of Los Angeles, ruining the entire system across the city. Next, Quinby and Snell, those who brought the allegations, argued that destroying streetcar infrastructure was essential to their goal of making the United States completely car dependent, which we now know was successful. Our country could not function if we stopped using all cars. Looking back on this information adds even more credibility to his argument. 
Even without this info, these companies were convicted for conspiracy to monopolize their industry through the use of the ACL and NCL companies. But they were not charged for trying to monopolize the ACL and NCL themselves, so they were not charged with owning a monopoly. Just creating the companies that became monopolies and then using those companies to have a monopoly themselves. In the end, General Motors was only charged $5,000 and their treasurer, H.C. Grossman, was fined a staggering one dollar, yes, one singular dollar, for creating and profiting from a multi-million dollar monopoly. That is this many zeros compared to this many. After thorough research, CBS's reporter Mark Henrick stated, there is no question that a GM-controlled entity called the National City Lines did buy a number of municipal trolley car systems, and it's beyond doubt that before too many years went by, those streetcar operations were closed down. It's also true that GM was convicted in a post-war trial of conspiring to monopolize the market for transportation equipment and supplies sold to local bus companies. And you can see how this infuriating conclusion to the case led many to believe that there was a deeper conspiracy, that they had bought them all just to destroy the streetcars and end up with a monopoly of our transportation because... Whether that's how they planned it to go, that is how it ended up. How Streetcars Actually Failed That quote from the CBS reporter, well, I didn't read you the last sentence. What's not true is that the explanation for these events is a nefarious plot to trade private corporations' profits for viable public transportation. In reality, many of these streetcar companies were going bankrupt at the time, and the takeover from General Motors only accelerated the process. There are many factors that were against the streetcar industry. They were charged both with business and property tax because they owned the railways. The city would not help them clean the streets, and these companies were again left to foot the bill. Then they were charged franchising fees that were based off of their total income, not their net income. And to top it all off, the same cities that were taking all the money from them would not even allow them to raise their prices to afford it. All this led to half the U.S. streetcar companies being bankrupt by 1918. 20 years before this whole monopoly conspiracy came to light. Then, in 1935, the Public Utility Holding Company Act was passed, which made it illegal for streetcar companies to sell their excess electricity to surrounding homes, cutting one of their last remaining lines of income. It turns out that the largest trouble that streetcars faced was not a ravenous monopoly, but the public policies that made it weak in the first place. Even the lawsuit itself had flaws. It turns out both mayors were already suing GM and had a monetary incentive to win this case. How we fell for it. Don't feel bad if you believe these claims at first. I myself was inclined to think that they were true before doing more research. This conspiracy succeeded from its use of many of Cialdini's six principles of persuasion. The first used was commitment. Appealing to people who already dislike traffic and highways will be more likely to agree so that they can stay consistent in their views. It was also used by first getting people to agree that GM was creating a monopoly, which there was plenty of evidence supporting. So it was then easier to convince them that the reason they were creating the monopoly was solely to destroy public transportation. They used liking because people already have negative views of America's transportation infrastructure, so arguments against it are easier to believe than ones that are for it. Their next mode of persuasion was pathos, stories of people whose lives have been forever altered because of car infrastructure. Then if that didn't sway you, they had logos, with the number of miles of railway that was destroyed, how close the dates were between the takeover and their collapse, and showing how the collapse of their competition would be, and has been, beneficial to their business. Finally, appealing to people's ethos, they use the principle of authority, using governors and high-up officials to help perpetuate their conspiracy. I even use this method to convince you that I'm more than just some guy ranting on the internet by wearing a professional shirt and tie. Now I'm some fancy guy ranting to you on the internet. But who falls for and who perpetuates these beliefs? Well, the main group is proponents of public transportation, I actually first heard it from a post on this subreddit. They use it as evidence for their cause, but in fact, it takes away credibility from the other claims. And as I described earlier, it shifts the focus away from the true cause of these issues, government policy and the inefficient use of public funding for private transportation. In the end, it is true that General Motors and many other companies were found guilty for conspiracy to monopolize. But the way in which they did it was not the same as described in the General Motors streetcar conspiracy. 
I hope this will make you more aware of the tactics that many use to influence your beliefs, and leave you with a better understanding of the history behind the General Motors streetcar conspiracy.